And um, now we have a speaker called Sam Nazarko. He's only 19 years old, but he's already developed two Linux distributions, Crystal Ubuntu and Raspberry MC. He's also authored Raspberry Pi Media Center. And he'll be talking about Raspberry MC's origins and the successes and challenges of developing for Raspberry Pi. So give a, give a hand for uh, Sam Nazarko. Hi. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Sam. I'm 19. I'm studying computer science at King's. Um, I did also work on Crystal Ubuntu earlier, um, but I'll get onto that when I discuss the origins of Raspberry MC. Uh, my interests are mainly virtualization, cloud computing, uh, and mainly Linux and embedded system development. Right. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, how the project really started. Uh, I'm going to look at its origins in, and its aims. Uh, I won't really go into depth with features, because I suggest you try it yourself. Uh, but what I'm mainly going to focus on is some of the design challenges and where the projects will be going in the future. Right, so basically, Raspberry MC is a Debian-based distribution uh, Debian is a Linux distribution, uh, first developed in 1993. Um, it's based on Raspbian, which in turn is a fork of Debian. And what we have there is uh, a distribution that takes advantage of Raspberry Pi's uh, floating point hardware. I'll talk about the transition from Debian as a vanilla upstream distribution to Raspbian shortly. Okay, um, XVMC, which Raspberry MC runs, is a free and open source media center. Uh, its origin started on the, on the original Xbox. Uh, now it runs on pretty much everything from Android to iOS to Windows. So it's definitely, it's highly forked. Uh, the Boxy Box is based off of it. Uh, Plex is based off of it. Uh, but some of its origins cause design challenges later on. So some of the things that made it great on the original Xbox cause challenges when moving it to new hardware. And we'll look at that. Um, OK, so when I was 16, I developed a Linux distribution called Crystal Ubuntu. And the reason for this was because the first generation Apple TV could only play 720p content. Um, this was fine for Apple because, as far as they're concerned at the time, iTunes content was only 720p. Uh, so there was no need to really play back any external content. Uh, you could run XBMC on it, but it was slightly crippled because it had to run on the modified version of OS X, which didn't have uh, 1080p video output. So with Linux and a Broadcom Crystal HD card, uh, we were able to get 1080p decoding. Uh, I, I added features such as automatic updating, um, and it, it really took off. So I was looking at another platform where I could continue this work on, because the first generation Apple TV isn't sold anymore. Um, and the Raspberry Pi seemed like quite a good candidate for that. Um, Apple TV itself isn't too bad. Uh, 38 watts at full load, 1080p decoding, even in 2013, that's pretty good. Um, with the Raspberry Pi, you've got a brilliant form factor. Uh, if you had it on for an entire year, it would cost you five pounds to run. Uh, so it's low power consumption, it's very small, and it's cheap. But more importantly, it was in production, or at least going into production. So um, I announced Raspberry MC, just literally chucked up a feature list, and. Uh, Liz Upton at the Raspberry Pi Foundation uh, put it on her blog. And that ended up in the website just going down, just out of sheer traffic that we had. And uh, they sent an early board, and I got working on it uh, in April 2012. I've uh, been forgetting to move those slides on. Right. Um, as for the project aims, I didn't really have many. Um, I wanted to hide the idea of a complex setup process. Linux is great, but you're 
I was going for more of a consumer approach. I didn't want the user to have to mess with the command line. I wanted them to be able to plug something in, have it auto-update, and anything they want. It needs to be expansive. So we need to offer the opportunity of using additional features. But we should fusicate that as much as possible. Right. This is how it looks after install. Um, it looks pretty much like any other XBMC install, except we've got a custom skin here, which was actually designed by a community member. OK, so in terms of project features, I won't really dwell on this for long. Um, we have 1080p 24 hertz support of MPEG-2, VC1, and H.264. Um, we've got CC support, so you can use your TV remote. Uh, instead of having to use a custom remote. Uh, AirPlay, GPIO, so you can use custom IR receivers. Um, pretty much all wireless adapters will work out of the box. Uh, you've got automatic updating, and you've got features like TV head end as a TV server. So you can add PVR capabilities just by picking up uh, a DVB tuner and plugging in an aerial. Uh, and you also have access to the standard apt repo, so you can install any packages you could get on a Debian system. Right, this is mainly what I'm going to focus on, is uh, the design challenges. So um, I'm going to quickly cover who's involved, how the install works, because uh, Raspberry MC doesn't install in the same way that most Linux distributions would. Um, and I'll talk about each component in depth and how it's optimized to bring the best experience. Right, so in terms of who's involved, uh, you have your upstream developers. So you have Debian, uh, you have the XBMC team, you have Pulsate for their work on the CEC library, and you have Broadcom and the Raspberry Pi Foundation themselves that do work on the binary blobs and firmware. Uh, Broadcom's main engineer is Dom Cobley, who's maintaining the firmware and kernel for Raspberry Pi at the moment. Um, downstream, we have our two Raspbian maintainers, who mainly uh, repackage Debian to take advantage of hardware-based floating point. And Raspberry MC is solely maintained by me at this point in time. Um, we did have a final developer, another developer, but he left after final release. Uh, in terms of community support, uh, the logo was designed uh, by the community. The website was designed by another enthusiast. Uh, we've got several forum moderators and IRC channel helpers. And we also have a good testing team. Um, so the testing team are essential to development. They've saved me hundreds of hours of testing myself. And without them, there's no way that the project would have got where it did. Right, so when installing Raspberry MC, I had a couple of simple aims. Uh, they shouldn't have to need any command line knowledge at all. Uh, and they should be able to customize their install. So if they want to run it off of a USB or an NFS share or set up Wi-Fi, it, it shouldn't be difficult. Um, Simple installation is crucial to the success of the distribution. If people will not try to, people will not jump through tutorials to get it set up. They want a simple install process. So let's look at how we've done that on Windows. Um, this is basically a .NET installer. It downloads an image, writes it to a device at the block level. Uh, the advantage of that is that you don't need to format the disk in any particular way. So Linux, we use an extended four file system. You don't need to support that in Windows. So you don't have any proprietary uh, licensing or any issues like that. You write it at the block level, forget about it. Um, you can configure stuff such as a static IP or Wi-Fi. And uh, another problem with Windows is if there is an extended four partition and you put your SD card back in, you'll only be able to see the FAT32 partition. So in order to get the full space of your device back, you need to use a Linux Live CD. Uh, to get around that, 
I added a little feature called restore formatting that just erases the master boot record and allows the user to just see their entire device again. Um, the, the OS X and Linux installer isn't so pretty. Um, the reason for this was because I, I could have used something like Qt or GTK and provide a UI, but I didn't want more dependencies. Um, it, this still takes the knowledge out of having to use DD. Uh, you still get, you can still configure all the options you can on the Windows version, but obviously it doesn't look as nice and it's a little trickier. Okay, what actually gets written to the SD card isn't Raspberry MC. Um, I developed another distribution called RAM distribution uh, so that we're able to actually install Raspberry MC onto the Pi uh, and always get the latest components. So um, originally, I used mDebian, and uh, I'd upload that into a temporary file system, change root, and it, it did not work. Installs were a serious swing and a miss. So um, you didn't even have full control of the SD card, so you couldn't really manipulate it well from user space. Um, so now, the simple solution is to use build root. Um, we take the tools we need, so we have uh, parted, we have DOSFS tools, WPA supplicant, WGET, a couple of tools. Um, we produce a small tarball, uh, we embed this as an initial RAM file system, and then we boot to RAM directly. And this gives us full control of the SD card. So uh, we can make the partitions there and then, uh, we can, if the user selects a USB install, for example, we don't need to create an extended four partition on the SD card. And if we had an image that was standalone and we just dropped that in, that would be more difficult later on. Sorry about this. Right. Um, so the process is, once, built, once RAM distribution runs, is uh, it connects to the content delivery network, and I'll talk about how I set that up later. Uh, it replaces the contents of the FAT32 partition. Uh, it'll download a root file system and leave put it on the NFS, USB, or SD target that the user's specified. Uh, it chucks an update system in, and then it performs a sysrq magic-based reboot. Um, the reason for the emergency reboot is speed. Uh, we can we can just reboot without worrying about corrupting any file systems uh, or waiting for processes to terminate gracefully because we are running in RAM. It doesn't matter if uh, the system doesn't exit gracefully. Uh, right, and then after the root file system's loaded and we reboot, uh, we reach a first time run process. And, uh, we generate some new SSH keys, uh, Dbus UUID, and for older Pis uh, that have only 256 megabytes of memory, we need to create a swap file. It's not ideal because it does wear out the SD card faster, but it is necessary. Okay, uh, the reason the main advantages of this RAM distribution approach is you don't need to rely on the user to download the latest image. A lot of users would download uh, Raspberry MC, extract it, the zip file somewhere, and then they'd always re-image with the same file. Uh, it would be a bad idea if we had to make sure they always had the latest version. Uh, this method will always connect to the CDN and always pull down the freshest files. Um, you, have, you can install on any device uh, simply by preceding the installer. Um, so before, before anything is installed, uh, RAM distribution checks the target and chooses where to install everything. It might seem like a slower process uh, if the Pi is doing all the legwork, but uh, if you download an old image, you'd have to install updates anyway. So more often than not, the process is equally as fast. Um, if we had a static image, we'd have 
more difficulty preceding. Uh, with a dynamic installer, we can check. We don't, it, it might not be the target we want to set. Um, we can use a custom root file system. And that really accelerates development. For example, if I build a new root file system that has uh, an updated library in it or a new test package, I can say to my testing team, OK, um, create a file called rootfs on the FAT32, put this in the file, and then the installer will check. And if that file exists, we can change the install process however we want. We can install any root file system. We can install custom packages. And it really accelerates testing. Uh, the testing team don't have to download a full image. They don't have to rebuild any images in kpartex. It's straight there. Uh, the UI is very ugly. Uh, the reason for that is because Raspberry MC doesn't use a display server. Everything's done in the frame buffer. So um, that's what a download would look like. Uh, it's done with pipe viewer, uh, dialog, wget, and tar. That's all you need, really. Um, it gets the message across. Right. So. The build process enables the install and update system to be modular. Uh, everything is built separately, packaged separately, and nothing needs to be bundled two ways. So we don't need to bundle one, th one way for the update system and one way for the installer. Uh, the installer and the update system are synchronized. Um, and the install scripts can be adjusted to fetch these new files without having to repackage any other components. So. I think I've updated RAM distribution about three times in the last year. And that's generally just to support uh, new, new RAM chips when the Pi manufacturing process changes. Right. With the file system, we want to configure as much as possible on the desktop. Uh, the Pi is obviously slower than your desktop. Uh, and you don't want the user waiting too long. Uh, so this is done via the bootstrap and a change root jail. Uh, we use Quimu to allow us to run ARM binaries on the desktop. And uh, after change routing, packages can be installed via apt and configured as if we were running on a Pi itself. Uh, that's then tarred up. Uh, I don't add kernel modules or XBMC binaries at this stage, because we want that to be handled by the update system to be truly modular. We don't want any changes to XBMC or the kernel to need a root file system rebuild. OK, so with the kernel, we have two aims. We need to optimize it, and we need to provide support for as much hardware as possible. So TV tuners, uh, GPIO, Wi-Fi. Um, so the build process is done in three ways. Um, we have the VFAT table, and that contains uh, the binary blobs to boot, so our bootloader. Um, we have command line dot text to, uh, for kernel command line arguments, and the configuration file, uh, and obviously the kernel image itself. Uh, the root file system table will contain the kernel modules to, su to provide support for additional hardware. And uh, lastly, kernel headers are optional. And um, these are built with make k package. But uh, these are optional because this very much slows down the installation time. Uh, as it stands, we're using the Linux 3.6 series of kernel. Um, and we're getting that from a upstream Raspberry Pi tailored kernel source. Right, so with XBMC, uh, I, I currently package the Frodo release, which is considered stable. Uh, that, too, is cross-compiled for speed. Uh, we've got four stages here. We check out upstream. Uh, we apply downstream patches. I'll talk more about what patches are needed in a bit. Um, we build it, and then we create a table with customizations. And the table we're creating is um, 
contains a custom skin. It will contain any libraries needed by XBMC uh, and the Raspberry MC settings plugin, which allows quick configuration of Raspberry MC. Uh, I also offer 24-hour nightly builds of Gotham, uh, which is the next release of XBMC, and that really helps accelerate testing. Um, one advantage we have is installing a nightly build is very, very easy. Uh, you go into Raspberry MC settings, you can pick from a list of nightlies, press it, and if anything goes wrong, you can switch back to the version you were running. And that is crucial for accelerating the testing and development process. Uh, as, soon as, as soon as you think you've got a fix for something, make a build, and there will always be someone willing to test it. Right, as you can imagine, uh, if I'd used a static image, someone could have torrented it or mirrored it, um, and it would have been a lot easier. Uh, once you've got a live installer, you need to have a server that stays up. You need to have an update system that stays up, and if it doesn't, people aren't happy. So um, these are the rough package sizes. Um, once you factor in updates, you have very, very high bandwidth requirements. Right. In just under a year, uh, a CDN that I built served 450 terabytes of bandwidth. Sounds like a lot, but it actually averages out to around 40 terabytes a month. Um, if you had a fully saturated 100 megabit connection, you'd probably be looking at 33 terabytes a month. So you need effectively to just have over a 100 megabit connection uh, to serve everyone. Right. But obviously, you can't just have a single server on a gigabit port. Um, we can't just rely on one box for failure's sake. Uh, and also, we, we want to distribute downloads to the relevant regions. Uh, also, it would cost a fortune. I ran it by Amazon. I think it would have costed, uh, so far, about $50,000 to have uh, mirrored everything. Right, so uh, when I launched the project, I did ask for help. Um, several organizations were very willing to help. Uh, so we, we had a couple of universities. We had the Raspberry Pi Foundation themselves, which was great. Um, and uh, about 100 people offered to host a mirror. Not everyone was suitable. And you have to pick the best candidates for mirrors. Um, if something goes wrong, you need to fix it very quickly, or you get a lot of users complaining. Uh, I remember once I went out for four hours, came back, and I'd annoyed an entire continent. So um, you have to be careful there. Right. Uh, these organizations synchronize hourly with my server via rsync. Uh, they make their files publicly available via HTTP, and then my server will redirect a user to a suitable mirror. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Right, so there are two ways you can redirect a user. You could use round robin DNS, or you could use a direct HTTP redirect. And um, the problem with round robin DNS is mainly time to live and expiry. Uh, if a mirror does go down with my system, I can remove them within a second. Uh, if something goes wrong with round robin DNS, you have time to live, you have caching perhaps at their end. It could be a couple of days before they're sent somewhere else. Um, I can ping a mirror or check an MD5 checksum, and if it doesn't match, remove it. So that's a lot more reliable. Uh, the HTTP redirect is quite simple, really. Um, they don't need to host any. They don't need any host name, no configuration. They just give us a URL prefix, and we forward that and append our directory structure to that. So for example, um, OK, the system relies on PHP, MySQL, mod rewrite, uh, RPOF, and GeoIP. Uh, it's only about 100 lines of code. That's it. 
Uh, when someone hits the server, the PHP script will look up a suitable mirror uh, based on their continent. Uh, there's no point doing it at a country level because we don't have that many mirrors. And well, yeah. So this does cause slowness in the US. That's the only problem. It's very large. Um, but then we forward the original URL with mod rewrite uh, to the domain prefix that we've retrieved from MySQL. Um, the reason we're using the RPATH mod is because uh, I use Varnish Cache uh, for concurrency issues, and it does molest the HTTP X forwarded uh, header by putting it in a separate header. So that's necessary. Obviously, there's a problem with this. Um, if I have a PHP script that looks up mirrors every time, uh, this is going to be very expensive on CPU. And you're also going to get this issue where you keep bouncing from different mirrors. Uh, so the trick is to stick with one mirror for the entire session. Um, and that's done with the update system, which is not apt-based. It will be in the future. At the moment, it's subversion-based. We've got two branches, release and testing. Um, this was done at the time for speedier deployment, and it sort of just caught on. Um, something gets pushed to testing. If the testing team are happy with it, it ends up being released. Um, and each component as part of the update system has separate scripts and versioning files. Right, so there are a few stages to the update system. Uh, the system boots and downloads a script that connects to the CDN and sets two environment variables. Uh, DL base has a path to a mirror that we've got from our PHP script. It's set as an environment variable now. We don't have to keep doing these lookups. We've now got the prefix URL, and this means we stop hitting the Raspberry MC download server, and we're now accessing the mirror directly. Um, we also have the source base environment variable, which has the subversion URL to the branch we're using. Uh, this means the update scripts can remain almost identical in release and testing, and yet they can be installing different packages. Right, now we download the latest update scripts for each component using the source base prefix and execute them. Uh, an update is just determined by running a diff on a versioning file. If it differs, we get an update. It's not the best way, but it, it did stick. And there are two types of update. Uh, we either update the entire package, uh, for example, the kernel or XVMC, or we use or we touch files on the file system as a form of versioning. For example, you can download a new kernel, 20 megabytes. You can't download a new root file system because one, the user might have made customizations to it. Two, it's mounted. And three, it would take too long. So we mark changes to it. And then in future builds of that file system, we also create that file. And then the update system knows not to reapply that update as it's already been installed. So to summarize with the update system, um, it, the user can turn them off. If it's turned off, we don't check. Uh, this only adds about 10 seconds to the boot if no update's available. Uh, with apps, this would probably take a lot longer. Uh, it's fully automated. So the user doesn't have much control over the update process, but that is something that will be worked on. As for the update cycle, uh, new features and improvements each month. Uh, updates to the kernel and XVMC are literally, as soon, as soon as something's worth pushing, it gets pushed. Right. When you're optimizing for Pi, uh, I was looking at performance, and I was looking at modularity. Because modularity is key in the user experience. We need to be able to update easily, and we need to give them full control. You'll see what I mean by that in a moment. Um, first case is to use uh, the Raspberry Pi's hardware floating point capabilities. Um, originally, I started with Debian Squeeze. And uh, software floating point 
it's okay. But uh, you really start to see the advantage of hardware-based floating point with DTS uh, decoding in software, for example. Um, there are also optimized memory set and memory copy routines uh, that are specific to Raspberry Pi and the ARM architecture. Okay, so I won't get into detail greatly on root file system optimization, but there are many things you get from uh, a vanilla to bootstrap that you really can cut out. For example, you've got Gettys uh, on TTYs that you don't need. So if you remove them, you save about 10 megabytes of RAM per teletype. So it's quite good. Um, now, one thing I did that sort of broke Debian here uh, in terms of upstream compliance was I used upstart. Uh, you've got sysv in it is the normal uh, dependency-based booting system. Uh, I chose upstart because it has a dbus interface and it allows us to load core services and have complete control of the boot process. So the user within the settings program can control uh, what they want started, whether they want an FTP server started, whether they want uh, a, a PVR server to run. And uh, one thing I didn't want to do is the classic way of removing symbolic links from run levels. I didn't want to mess with that. Uh, how it works is XBMC starts our plugin runs. It parses XML. Uh, and if the user wants to run the service, uh, they will, if the user wants to run the service, then uh, we place the signal on DBus, Upstart picks that up and starts the service. Um, it does have its drawbacks, obviously. It's not, com it's not really compliant with Debian. Um, some app packages don't like Upstart and they try and mess with the initialization system. Uh, and there's also a noticeably slower boot time. Um, I'm going to resolve this by moving over to system D. OK. OK. Um, when looking at speed and stability, there are a few, there are a few tricks we can use. Um, by default, Raspberry Pi has a turbo mode now. Uh, so it dynamically scales the frequency. Uh, it's to preserve the Pi's lifetime. Uh, but in all honesty, it's more likely to break if you either step on it or a connector will fall off. Um, we can improve the responsiveness by using a performance governor and running the Pi at full speed for the first few seconds of boot. Um, and then after about 40 seconds, we switch back to an on-demand governor. What we can also do is um, reduce the threshold on which on-demand starts scaling frequencies. Uh, in Linux, by default, it's 80%, which is very high, and it results in a slow response to an increase in load. By decreasing this to about 50%, we get a much quicker initial response, and the UI seems a lot more responsive. Um, we also have the read ahead buffer. Uh, by default, Linux will only read 128 kilobytes ahead of any read request. Uh, if we increase this to 2 megabytes, we go from about 6 megabytes read speed to about 15. So we definitely see an improvement there. Um, and we can reduce unnecessary writes uh, by, using, by putting the logs and the temp in a temporary file system. Um, I'm not too fussed about write cycles and preserving life because... Um, SD cards are cheap, and I don't expect them to last more than a year or so. Um, so this is more to just reduce write back and get better read results as well. Um, we can also use the hardware watchdog. Uh, Pi has a hardware watchdog, which means we can make it so that if a daemon we have written doesn't send a heartbeat, uh, the hardware watchdog can trigger a reboot. Now. Uh, this is quite good if the system freezes and the user doesn't know what they're doing. And we can also use it to detect potential problems with their power supply. OK. Um, a small comparison of XVMC on the Pi versus a standard Linux system. Uh, we don't have a display server. Uh, we're using an EGL accelerated frame buffer. 
Um, and we've also got the problem that on Linux normally, we have hardware acceleration as an option. We've always got that FFmpeg fallback. So if we can't play a codec in hardware, if we don't have hardware acceleration, we can always play in, so in software. On Pi, we don't have that. We have OpenMax Player. And if OpenMax Player won't play it, you can't watch it. Um, so you've got challenges there. Um, OpenMax Player is very, very, very immature. Um, we've only got Rewind support in July. Uh, it's been completely refactored. Uh, and fixes for playback issues are discovered on a daily basis. OK, so XBMC has its pitfalls. Uh, when Raspberry MC started, the stable Eden build never supported the Pi. So we had to ship uh, Frodo Alpha builds to people uh, as a test, which wasn't great. Um, and I said at the beginning that some of XBMC's history on Xbox has a negative impact. Uh, for starters, XBMC tries to redraw itself at 60 frames per second constantly. Uh, the Pi can't really do that. So we can try and deal with dirty region rendering. Um, if we had a display server, uh, we would only need to redraw the parts of the screen that change. Because we're running in the frame buffer, any time that the screen changes, we must redraw the whole screen. Uh, by default, RSS feeds are on, which means you're constantly redrawing. So obviously, we disable that downstream. Uh, and there's also a bug in XBMC that causes labels to constantly update. Uh, there's work to track it down, but what it means is sometimes you have the CPU pegged at 100% and you don't know why. The UI isn't updating, but you're still pegging the CPU. Uh, when, it's not at, uh, when it's not at 100%, it idles at about 14, which is good. Right, so let's talk about the project reception then. Um, when I announced it, I got a very good response. Uh, every, everyone wanted to help with it, which was great. Uh, it's had great press coverage from technical websites to just uh, even New York Times, which is fantastic. Um, Pact Publishing approached me to write a book on it, which was great. Um, so yeah, there was, some, there was some good response there. Uh, some stats now. It's been installed 1.4 million times as of August. Uh, it's served 600 terabytes of content on the CDN. Uh, and I estimate that the daily user base is around 50,000. Um, I honestly have no idea. There's 50,000 synchronizations per day, but I don't know how many people reboot their Pi every day. Um, this is based off unique IP addresses. Uh, so people with multiple Pis, you're only coming up as one. Um, I'd make a conservative estimate that one in five pies have run Raspberry MC at some point. Um, and after Raspbian, there's no doubt uh, that, Raspbian, uh, that Raspberry MC is the second most popular distribution. OK, so I mentioned that Debian and XBMC were successful and highly forked. So let's look at where Raspberry MC is going. Um, we've got a French company using Raspberry MC for high quality audio output. Uh, they're using a USB sound card. Uh, we've got project... Uh, project Kawa in Brazil and Latin America. And um, that is a project that attempts to use thin clients uh, in apartment complexes and create an affordable model of computing uh, and stimulate jobs in the IT sector in Latin America. And uh, Raspberry MC will play a role in that. Uh, Element 14, which is one of the world's largest electronic distributors, now sells an XBMC kit, um, which bundles Raspberry MC with a remote. Uh, and other companies have expressed intent to use Raspberry MC later this year. Right. There was also some negativity. Um, Unlike Crystal Ubuntu, uh, Raspberry MC runs in more diverse situations. Uh, with an Apple TV, there was never an issue of power supply. 
uh, there was never an issue of your SD card or your USB because most people ran it off the hard drive. Um, and a lot of people overclock their Pi but don't seem to realize that it they very much vary across batches. Um, so the most common issue people get is freezing or lockups. And there's two reasons for this. Either they overclock their Pi too high or their power supply is inadequate. Um, the Raspberry Pi needs a power supply of at least one amp at five volts. Uh, but just because it says that on your charger does not mean it delivers that. Uh, it's an unregulated market, and most people use their phone charger, um, which has no guarantee. It's never been stress tested. Uh, the only way to really test is to put a voltmeter across it. And the amount of times people have had lockups uh, and said, well, I have a one amp supply, and then measured it and realized that they, they're not getting five volts. They're getting like 4.6. Uh, and that generally is why they get freezes. Um, once you're fully saturating the ARM core with software DTS and you've got the video core decoding 1080p, you really need a good power supply. Um, we didn't hit final until February. And although I said the press was good, it did have the problem of everyone would get a Pi and try it. And they're trying beta software. The UI installer was very easy. There was no challenge to get it running. But then once they were running, they expected it to run like something that was final. And it really was not ready. Uh, so a lot of people would try it and not come back to it. OK, so I'm just going to end by saying where the project's going now. Um, I noticed that a lot of Raspberry MC and Crystal Ubuntu code is shared. And if I unified the code base, I could support other platforms. Um, the update system shared. The upstart jobs are shared. The configuration add-on is shared. Um, and in the time taken to copy code over, I could use the time much more productively uh, by unifying the code base and looking at other platforms. So the plan is Link's BMC. Um, it's not just another XBMC distribution. Um, the plan is to, uh, you've got distributions already, like XBMC Ubuntu. Um, but the plan here is to create a real ecosystem. Uh, I noticed that XBMC Ubuntu doesn't really have an upgrade path. Uh, and outside of XBMC, it's kind of feature lacking. Um, with Lynx BMC, all your settings will be in the cloud. Uh, if you've already got a Lynx BMC system set up, you can just You'll be able to see it and it'll be able to copy settings from it. Um, you'll be able to stream from your PC. So if you're on YouTube and you think, I want that on the TV, click it, and it's on the TV. So there'll be Chromecast support, AirPlay mirroring. Um, and in, for example, in Windows, if you have a, if you have a video file, uh, you could right click, send to, and Link's BMC will show itself there. Uh, and if it can't play it back, as I said earlier, if Open Max Player couldn't play it, for example, uh, the PC will automatically be begin transcoding it and segmenting it to the device that it needs to be played back on. Um, there'll be a dashboard. So you'll have an app store where you can install additional software like Ambilight support. Uh, there's food ordering, for example. I was very much surprised that uh, services like Just Eat have a completely open API, and no one's even had a go at ordering food yet. So, um, so yeah, the plan there is to also have strong hardware support. Um, so I don't like the idea of following tutorials. I want you to be able to plug the device in and be ready to go with it. Um, in terms of the technical side, It'll be based on Debian Wheezy. Uh, I'll use systemd. Um, the whole API for the dashboard and everything will be written in C and interfaced in Python with Swig. And this will give us uh, a lot of, of very responsive interface, even on the most underpowered of platforms. Uh, updates will be through apps, so the user will be able to install updates through XVMC and actually pick the updates they want. So if they don't want to update the kernel, they can just update XVMC. Um, so should be out by quarter one, 2014, although whenever I give dates, they're always 
over underestimates. So um, what's really important me to me, though, is that I want someone to see Lynx BMC and know that they'll get a consistent experience across any platform. I don't want the fear of, oh, I'm only running it on a Pi. They should be able to install it on anything from a quad-core box to uh, an ARM device and get a good experience throughout. Uh, and you can find out more at linksbmc.com. That's it. Any questions? Has anybody got any questions? Please put your hand up. Hello. Um, I don't know if it's allowed to ask, but there are simi uh, similar um, Linux distributions with XBMC. What mm -hmm. makes your distribution better than the others? <laughs> Good question. Um, I okay, so we've got OpenLAC, and um, I think it's too shut down. I think the Pi is a tinkerer's toy. Um, we still manage to achieve the benefit of completely hiding the command line. Uh, you don't need any experience. And yet, we still offer the flexibility uh, of expansion. So you can use uh, USB sound cards. You can use, ambi uh, you can use an Ambilight-like implementation. Um, it really, try what you like. But um, there are some limitations with other distributions. Is it likely you're ever going to be able to have integration with things like Netflix and Spotify? Um, Spotify, there is integration. Um, when, we had, when we were based on Squeeze, there was an ARM library that worked. When we moved to uh, Wheezy with our hardware-based floating point, we had problems because Spotify would not recompile their library for us. Um, I think they did it eventually. I, I, it's not something I use, but I, I think it got done. As for Netflix, uh, that requires Silverlight, and Silverlight support on Linux is not great. We will get a web browser in Raspberry MC, uh, and not a frame buffer one. I looked at that, but it required a mouse. We will actually have a Wayland accelerated web browser. Hi, San. Thank you for the conference. Very amazing. Can you please explain how are you thinking to do OTA update? Sorry? If you can explain how are you thinking to do the OTA? O uh, over the air updates, yeah. what about them? Uh, how it will work? Yeah. Um, with Lynx BMC, it will be an automated, um, it will be automated via apt. Uh, you'll have your Python plugin in XBMC. Uh, it will update the app repository list, uh, check for new packages, and present to you a list of those that are upgradable. And you will be able to just tick the ones you want, press upgrade, and it will upgrade. Any more questions, anyone? Hi, yeah. So when you bring out the new uh, system. Yeah. Are you going to keep the old one? Um, I'm not going to deprecate it. You'll still be able to install it, but uh, future work will go into this unified code base. So you'll still be able to install it, but there won't be a point, really. Um, you're not going to lose anything by the new system, if that makes sense. Do we have any more questions? No? OK. All right. So um, thank you very much, Sam. Um, so that was Sam Nazarko about Raspberry uh, BMC. So um, clap your hands together for Sam Nazarko. Um, so we're going to have a five minute break. Um, and you're welcome to come back for Alistair Peterson, um, who will be talking about a digital shadow next. Thank you.